All right, hello, software engineers. I am back, this time wearing an actual shirt that a non-man-child would wear, unlike the football jersey I wore in the last video. But today, we are going to be discussing uh, oops, functional decomposition. So this is uh, the first part of two videos on decomposition. And remember, uh, I mentioned last time, decomposition is the idea that we want to take a broad problem statement and break it down into implementable modules. Uh, and which these modules are, what or what these modules are, depend on what type of decomposition we're doing. Uh, so last time we talked about modularity, we talked about how we design modules to be modular, and I realize that almost sounds like a tongue twister to say, modular modules, but um, we, we talked about how modularity benefits a software system and how, it, uh, how we can generate good design properties within our modules. Things like high cohesion, loose coupling, good use of information hiding and abstraction. Uh, so now the next step, given a problem and, and given that we know what kind of modules we want, how do we break the problem down into modules? How do we compare design decisions? If, 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 if two people want to break it down a different way, which is better? Or, um, and then finally, how do we communicate these designs to the people who will implement them uh, such that they'll be implemented reliably to the design? So first, broadly, I've already mentioned this, there's kind of two broad sets of decomposition. We are focusing on the first. So there's functional and there's object oriented. And generally, when we're talking about a functional decomposition, we're, we're basing it our, uh, around the verbs in the problem statement. Something like, uh, and this is a particular example we're gonna look at later, uh, for each employee, uh, generate a paycheck. And how that can break down into a lot of different subsets. And each of these modules we design are based on kind of actions that the system needs to take. Uh, it, it helps us. And then we, we, we can also use those, those modules to break down things like control flow of the system, decisions that need to be made, etc. Um, Object-oriented decomposition, we're going to focus on the actors of the system and how different actors interact. And by actors, we don't necessarily mean humans. In fact, we very rarely do. Uh, we're talking about just different entities within the system, things like this is uh, a module that reads in a large number of tweets and generates a list of tweets or something like that. That would be an actor. Um, we're talking about uh, object oriented. And, you know, when we're talking about functional, we're not going to use objects. So oftentimes uh, a lot of procedural focused languages and yes you can do procedural coding in java and python but you can also do classes in java and python so let's kind of put a line there and say like okay for procedural languages this is primarily how we can do decomposition and this would also be used in an soa this is a service oriented architecture service oriented architecture and we talked about that it was in the slides for the last video, uh, if you if you don't recall, um, and and so with functional decomposition, we want to take the problem and break it down into individual functional parts. That is function parts, and we can often do this uh, based on a chronological decomposition. We do A, then we do B, then we do C, then we do D. We go further. We could say, okay, so if this is our main, and we break it down to A, B, C, D. Well, we can take part A and say, okay, A breaks down into A1, A2, A3, and so on. So each part can be broken down further, and it all starts up at the top at main. And so the main is actually going to be used. We're, we're reliably lying on the fact that there is a main that is calling all of these functions either directly or calling the functions that call these functions or, you know, so on. And the idea is we want to make each smaller part, that is, you know, here we have main and here we have the small part, that is a module that is called like a function by main or by the level above it if, if it's 
not directly below main if it's maybe indirectly below main. Uh, and, and so, you know, this does have an advantage. This does naturally support things like data coupling. Data needed by the smaller part, uh, smaller parts of the program can be passed as parameters. That's generally pretty good, right? Um, and we're going to show here in a second uh, something called a structure chart. And this is uh, central to a methodology for design called structured design and how we can use that module calling structure as a way to both help us decompose the system and then turn around and actually design test cases for the system. Um, there are problems with this approach. Namely, uh, it, it doesn't really work with information hiding as much. Um, you know, when you're passing uh, data structures you know, from main to the, to, the, to the functions, often those functions may have to perform side effects, that is, manipulate those data structures. Uh, so at that point, we're talking about a bit about coupling. Um, and the data issues are scattered across the system. That is, the parts of the system that need to deal with data are throughout the system. They're not just in, like, in a, in a, in a, a layered three-tier architecture. They're not just in the data layer. They're, they're, there's not a, a clear place where this is where all the data manipulation occurs. In fact, we, we actively avoid that with a functional decomposition. Chloe, can you not knock that lamp over? Okay, hang on. Chloe, are you being a bad girl? Chloe? No, Chloe. Chloe. Hang on. I'm, I, 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 part of me says I should edit this part out, but part of me says that people would enjoy this. Chloe, get down. Hey, down. 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 Okay. Should I edit that part out? I don't know. I'll decide. Maybe maybe I'll do a, a a version of the video without takes, and it'll be it'll be there. Okay. Functional decomposition. So so again, the 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 data issues are are scattered throughout the system rather than just being in a data layer because a layered architecture really requires you doing object oriented uh, design rather than a functional design. Uh, that said, a functional design, uh, when your system is simple enough to allow for it, really does actually have uh, a, a good structure for optimization because you can focus on optimizing each function. Uh, you don't have to worry about like this this big heavy thing called state where there's a bunch of objects that are that are maintaining a state over time. Um, and a higher level functional architecture, a service oriented architecture is good for certain types of distributed systems. Very good for certain types of distributed systems. And so we can design by functional decomposition how that works. So broadly, uh, this is the kind of structure diagram that we would um, that we would build here. The idea is we start up at main. And let's say that main has to read in some type of data, it has to process some type of data, and it has to print or generate an output uh, of the results, generate some kind of output. So this would be main. We could break each of these steps down into three functions, like read input data, process the data, do whatever summary or information you need, and then print the results of that summary or, or, or whatever you need. Um, so let's think of it in terms of, let's say our main problem statement was for each employee, get, get their hours to determine their pay, perform all the necessary withholdings, uh, tax withholdings on their pay, and then generate a paycheck. So let's see what that would look like. And this is, uh, this is from Wikipedia. This is a structure chart. And the idea is, okay, generate payroll. This is the overarching main. The first thing it does, and notice we have this arrow that's kind of rotating counterclockwise. The idea here is we just work from left to right. It's quite simple. And generate payroll just calls the get payroll record. It doesn't need to pass any information. It just says, hey, get the, get the payroll record, get for this employee, uh, how many hours they worked or, or whatever. Um, so this is going to go to some file and read the payroll record. It's going to pass 
and notice you'll see some information being passed back. Um, uh, it's going to read the payroll record until an end of file is reached, EOF. Uh, from there, we are going to pass the payroll record to some validation system. Maybe this is just the manager, you know, checking that the manager has validated the pay uh, payroll is accurate. If the record's valid, that gets passed back. And then all this information, the, the payroll information, uh, the payroll and the validated record gets passed back to the generate payroll, goes to calculate net pay. How do we calculate that? Well, first we get the gross pay. So if you're hourly, this is just your hourly rate times hours worked, uh, maybe with overtime, whatever. Uh, and you can see that information being labeled, being passed. And then the gross pay is passed back. The gross pay and the employee ID is passed to calculate deductions. Uh, that information is used to calculate tax withheld, calculate social security withheld. It sends these amounts back, which gets sent back to net pay. And it will then, um, you know, this, to this after the total deductions is how much the employee is paid. We then update the employee record with their gross pay and their total deductions. So this is, Notice again, we we're just doing data manipulation stuff everywhere here. Uh, but that gets passed back, that gets passed back. And then the last step is to send all the payroll check data, uh, which is sent back by Calculate Net Pay to print check. And then from there, check printed, and that's the end of the system. So this you could design, I mean, in a single program, right? This is your main up here at the top. You write a function called get payroll record that uses a sub function read payroll record and validate payroll record. All this could be done in functions. Notice we're not talking about any kind of objects here other than the data being passed back and forth. Uh, but that data, notice we're not doing anything with it. It could be a struct, for example, in C in the most complicated case, and that would still be fine. We don't have any objects here we just have data. We've broken it down this way. And this is an okay way. And in fact, you can do functional decomposition uh, on functions in object-oriented design. You can take a single function and decompose it further. Uh, if it's complicated and you want to do that, and you can typically do it in this kind of way. Um, but of course, again, we have an issue of, you know, however the payroll record's being read, it seems like from a file here, that's, you know, that is being done and the end of file information is being sent to get payroll record. That's not really any information hiding here. Um, so for if this were a more complicated system, maybe we want to start thinking about objects and things like that. And we'll get into object decomposition next time. But this is a functional uh, structure chart. Um, from there, next time, we're going to look at object-oriented decomposition. So that's right, this video is under 15 minutes, uh, counting the, the, uh, the cat being bad. Um, this is primarily for class-based languages, so like Java, C Sharp, Python can be a class language. Often we use it in a procedural way, but it can be very class-based. And it's built around the idea that for our problem, we identify entities, uh, that is, the actors within the system. We identify what state they need to keep track of and what behaviors they support. And then from there, we establish how all these entities interact with each other. And this is how we we'll often describe the business logic of our system. So if you remember back to layered architecture, it's kind of the, the three tiers. The middle tier is there. But that's all we have for this time. So a nice short video. Uh, take a look at structure charts if you want some examples. There's plenty online. And we will see you next time for object-oriented decomposition. Take care.